Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host this evening, Brian Broom, and I'm joined by Greg Uttinger and Emily Maxson. Tonight we'll be discussing the rain mistakes, mostly the mistakes of <laughs> King Solomon, and maybe how we can avoid some of the same problems. Um, not in a moralistic kind of way, just a analytical kind of way, if you will. <laughs> so, Greg, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Well, I suppose of all the Old Testament characters there are to know about, even small children know about Solomon. Something about Solomon and all his glory being arrayed in better clothes than flowers. We know that. And they, they know about cutting the baby in half. And they may even know that he built this temple thing. It's amazing what small children do and do not know about the Bible. But they probably heard of Solomon, of course, was David's son. He was a son by Bathsheba, the woman with whom David had committed adultery. And yet God did not require David to divorce her and, and this son. God bless. He sent by the the prophet and called his name Jedidiah, which is beloved of the Lord. So we have this up front that God loves Solomon. And evidence, he ends up writing three books of scripture, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. And he's the wisest man ever. What could possibly go wrong here? Pride. <laughs> yeah, He pride can be wise pride. and also a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he specifically asked for wisdom to judge Israel, but even that kind of deserted him. Well, for those who do not know his story, uh, we, we we talked a little bit about the dividing the baby or not dividing the baby apart last time. Uh, beyond that, the next big thing I suppose is construction of the temple. David had wanted to do it to build a palace for God, and God had said, "No, your hands are full of blood, and you're not the man to do it. Your son will be a man of peace." And Solomon Shalom means peace, so he gets to do it. He's a type of a figure of Jesus. He is the wisest of men. Kings and wise men from across the world come to hear his wisdom, including the Queen of Sheba. Probably everyone knows that story. For I don't know why, but they do. Uh, he builds the temple of the Lord. He's the king of Israel. And in his days, everyone sits under their vine and fig tree and none makes them afraid. And we even get uh, descriptions of his temple because he feeds his people, his servants, well. And he's extremely hospitable and has just plenty of food, delicacies and such to give to those who come to visit him and who want to hear about him. In the process of building the temple, he also builds his own palace, which is adjoined to it, because as an adopted son of God, he, unlike Saul, gets to live next door to dad, as it were. His, his palace is uh, an adjunct to Yahweh's palace. So many good things going. The palace, the temple he builds is huge. It's glorious. It's one of the wonders of the ancient world. It actually puts most of the seven wonders of the ancient world to shame in terms of beauty and glory. The pyramids were bigger, but that's about all they had going for them. You mean that gigantic triangles aren't like... <laughs> <laughs> Pythagoras disagrees. <laughs> yeah, well, don't they collect energies from the stars and... Landing bases for mothership. Okay, whatever. Yeah, they're they're spaceships. Yeah. So anyhow, on TV. Exactly. Yes. So has everybody else. <laughs> uh, oh, aliens. Aliens. Yes. Um, yeah. Is such a thing. Or, even or we can go down the other yes. trail of Solomon as one of the key members of founding Freemasonry. But let's just skip that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so everybody wants a piece of Solomon. Everyone wants to borrow Solomon for something. His temple was similar to the tabernacle, but much bigger and larger, more light, more menorahs, more tables of showbread. In addition, the um, um, the laver was no longer laver, but it was a huge brazen sea supported by 12 uh, brazen oxen. On top of that, there were uh, water chariots that at least in theory could carry water out. So images of, of God's word and spirit going out to the Gentile worlds. But rather, the Gentile world came to see it because it was really cool and beautiful. Um, and in addition, we get orchestras and choirs singing the word of God, because by now most of the Psalms were completed. And what God's people had not had before, the, the spoken, sung, musically played word of God was available 
Anytime you went into the temple, they could, you could probably hear someone singing the word of God. And we all know that if you can sing something, it's a whole lot easier to memorize. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a lot going on here. And there was, I mean, that's the only reason I memorized the apostles creed in junior high was because of Rich Mullins. <laughs> really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. I'm, no, never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we got all this going, but at the same time, Solomon engages in foreign trade, which is in itself, not a bad thing. Now, we look at our federal government, and supposedly the federal government is a non-profit organization. No reason why. Uh, it doesn't supposedly do business. But in that day, kings were in this awkward uh, equipose between being private citizens with lots of money and being public figures who had to take care of their nation. So kings would get lots of money, but then they were expected to do stuff with that money that benefited the nation. Not, it's not like... We don't pay the the our president billions of dollars and say and and go use this to defend us and enhance our cities and build these canals. <laughs> it wouldn't happen. But he he was doing all this. Some of it was okayish. You know. I mean, that's a really interesting framework distinction where for us the president is an employee of the federal government. Yes. Whereas mm. the king is really the person of the state, yes. which is a, a concept as Americans we don't. We don't believe in personal embodiments, which no, I feel like gives well, and, us and trouble with even, Christianity in general. <laughs> and I, I think that even even um, the English monarchy did did not quite feel comfortable with one person being the embodiment of the state, even if they saw the monarch as the head of the state. There was still also the parliament. Yeah, yeah. There was yeah. there was always limitations going back to the Anglo-Saxon stuff, but before there was always a balance to the king, and yet that idea. But the king is somehow married to the people and married to the land does exist. I was just reading um, a mystery story, and I forget the name of Catherine Aird or something like that. I forget the name of the author. Someone I haven't read in ages. And the, the policeman was struggling with this idea. He's investigating a murder that takes place in, the, in an earl's castle. It's set in the present. Um, and he realizes, what, what is an earl anyway? <laughs> oh, he has this function with uh, in terms of the king or queen, since it's modern. And the things that earls were supposed to do were these kind of things. Oh, wait, isn't that what I do now as a policeman? Ha! <laughs> huh. And he struggles with it. It's not a major thing, but it is something that he thinks about along the way. And we, it brings up, yeah, the things that the, the cop does, he does in the name of the queen and under her authority and for her welfare and the welfare of her people. And it's just an interesting thing that we don't think about we don't have a king or queen and we yeah there's a there's a great line in leverage where someone asks a marine so are you married i'm married yes i'm married to the constitution of the united states <laughs> like, oh gosh okay <laughs> not quite the same thing but you know patriotism and all that well it's it's interesting too because um my emily and i have been watching through um a show called merlin that i think i recommended on the last mm -hmm. episode and it's it's very funny to me because the idea of the sovereign being married to the land has right. shown up several times, especially when the druids show up and start messing with things. Yeah. Uh, I think at one point, I think it was a, a unicorn was killed by Prince Arthur. And as a result, all of Camelot suffered from drought mm -hmm. and famine, like mm -hmm. magically induced. And it, it, it was very interesting because, of course... Uh, the main characters being our modern contemporary viewpoint characters are like, but that's not fair. I'm the one that did the thing wrong. You can't just punish everyone else. <laughs> but yeah, at that but time, <laughs> that that would have been the expected thing. It's like, oh yeah, the sovereign messed up. The land is suffering because of it. And like, he needs to atone. Yeah, the grail legends are, are full of that. The, the Fisher King mm -hmm. has been wounded between the legs. <clears throat> and because of that, he's non- procreative and therefore the land is suffering the land is wasted and until mm -hmm. someone can find him and basically take his place answer the questions about the grail the land can't not be healed and t.s Eliot brings that forward in his poem the wasteland the yeah. same kind of imagery the land is waste because the king i suppose modern modern man now taking the place of the king is himself empty and so the land also is suffering everything is suffering well, I mean, you could of... even 
draw that to today with our our culture's current confusion over gender. Mm. I just read a, a really great article. I think it was published today by Carl Truman in First Things, mm. uh, talking about that very thing and how our confusion about you know the the topical thing from the past week was uh, you know I don't know what a woman is. I'm not a biologist. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actual the, the thing, thing is, said by a Supreme mm. Court nominee in front of uh, the Senate. By the way, oh, yeah. that's what she said. Yes, yes. I, I, I all I saw was, you know, so and so's in trouble because of a passing remark. I think, like, what did she say? I don't know. Oh no, that's it was not that. a passing remark. <laughs> no, it was a direct yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, but you <laughs> know, you have an answer. Yeah. You, you have that issue, and it really stems from not knowing what a person is. But yeah. More mm-hmm. broadly speaking, is that it? It, it does have a um, national effect. What the majority of the nation actually believes and and is um espousing that's the word i was looking for espousing ha. interesting uh-huh. word. <laughs> yes last night bible study brian we were talking about covenant or i have talked about covenant for a long time and i asked a rhetorical but leading question i said is my cat or is our cat pepper within the covenant and i think everyone was suspecting a trick question or something <laughs> um but I said, I'll give you a hint. Our cat. Yeah. She's ours. And I'm God's. So does God's covenant reach to her or not? Mm. It was actually an anti-Baptist uh, argument, sort of, because if the cat's <laughs> in the covenant, then what's it say about children? Well, but, cats don't um, have free will, so. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Free will screws everything up. Oh, but wait, we're talking about Sovereign Grace Baptist. That's, there's the rub. <laughs> It makes more sense for Armenian Baptists. Anyhow, which is kind of how where I ended up arguing. If God is sovereign, then he claims everything I am. That includes my sexuality, my future, my children, and yeah. how I how I nurture my children and what I can require of them while they're in my house. Like going to church. You know, this is not this is not um, various circles, independent circles of autonomy. This is sovereign covenant authority and love. Yeah. Anyhow, that said, that, that brings us to Solomon and um, uh, his, well, let me just read this verse. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Mm-hmm. Solomon clave unto these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, not princesses, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build in a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, that's in the hill before Jerusalem. That's the Mount of Olives. And for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And he did a lot, and likewise he did for all of his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord. Mm. Uh, the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Yeah. And what happens next belongs more, I think, to the next um, the next discussion. But Solomon's fall, we see beginning here. Now there, there are echo, there, there's I, I don't know what's the word hints of things coming attractions in what in the previous chapter. He's collecting an awful lot of gold, not even silver, gold. And he's buying horses from Egypt. He's engaging in arms trade uh, because horses were aggressive weapons. And the thing is that the law in Deuteronomy 17 had said, you're going to have a king one day. And there's a number of things that are required of the king, like copying out the law of God and knowing it inside out so you can apply it, being one of the common people and such. But three particular prohibitions were don't multiply gold and silver to yourself, don't multiply horses, and don't multiply wives. It's um, three for three. Yeah, you know, the gold and silver, uh, enormous amount. It, 
when we think of inflation, we normally think of uh, fiat money being printed by the government. It's one of the rare cases in world history where gold created inflation because there was so much of it in Israel. Silver was worth nothing, we're told. Uh, it drove silver off the market. There was so much gold available. Wow. Interesting. And so much effort. silver available, obviously. Yeah. Like if, uh, if if silver had been more rare than gold, then silver could have been the chief <laughs> currency. <laughs> well, that's true. The weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six talents of gold. Now I don't know if you mm. caught that number written out, or spoken out that way, but that's six six six. When I was in college, one of my friends asked. Uh, do you think that means anything? I said, yeah, it means he got 666 talents. <laughs> I didn't understand biblical theology very well at that point. Although it's the correct It, it is answer. correct as far, as, far as, as you go. go. Historically, it is indeed what happened. But God is laying the foundation for other numbers that are going to come along, other uses of that number. Yeah. So that's a little spooky when that number shows up at that point. And, then uh, and how many years before the writing revelation is this? A thousand? Yeah, but yes. Almost exactly, as a matter of fact. And then we find out that, that Solomon was horse trading with Egypt. But he wasn't, He uh, we have records that he kept a lot of the horses and had horse stalls and such by the lots. But he also sold a lot of the horses to other kings, like the kings of Syria, who later would use them to attack Israel. So there was a good move. Great. Let's, <laughs> let's arm our future enemies. That always helps. But, and, and I mean, we can, proud long tradition of yeah. that in the past several decades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who can we arm this this month? Um, but I, I think we've kind of agreed that we want to talk about the third thing, and that's the strange woman he married. First of all, strange means foreign. <laughs> it's outside the covenant. It's not that they were bizarre. <laughs> yeah, they just they funny. That one's really yeah. strange. <laughs> she has three arms. What do you see? No, it was... <laughs> We Solomon in Proverbs had warned his son about strange women, and but that, yet that's exactly what he falls for. He was, in fact, when he came to the throne, he was already married, interestingly enough, to an Ammonite. Oh, Rehoboam's mother, Solomon's heir, was an Ammonite. That's a little weird, and we never find any other explanation. It seems hard to read an Ammonite into Song of Solomon as the bride he's celebrating. So that leaves some interesting questions as to what's happening there. And she does bear him a son, Rehoboam. We don't find that any of these other women bore him sons. He may, they may have, but they're not highlighted any place. Well, it is, it is also interesting, though. You, I, just something that I pieced together: if the bride of Song of Solomon is a Gentile, then that is yet another prefiguring of the Gentiles being brought in. Yeah, and and, and if, I think you can make an argument that the the bride is she. It's it's hard to read exactly what's going on. She talks about her skin being dark, but she says it's because she's had she's been kept out of the sun, working in the vineyards, and not been able mm -hmm. to take care of herself. Does that mean she was naturally darker skin, or and and thus perhaps from another ethnic group, or is it just means that the bride was someone who came out of the fields and out of poverty and. Mm. Had just worked all her life like Ruth. Right. We don't know the answer to that exactly. Um, the Bible says that King Solomon loved these women. He clave unto them in love. The Bible uses the word love as we do in lots of different ways. And, and sometimes there's almost a sardonic or sarcastic overtone in the word. Um, he did, well, let, let's put this in perspective. This seems to fall after the completion of the temple. The temple took 20 years. He reigned for 40. So he's got 20 years to accumulate a thousand wives. That's busy. That's busy. That's roughly a wife a week. That's the new uh, reality show on TLC. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So he's, uh, this is not, there's no way you can define this as love unless you, by love, you simply mean a moment of passion that's, you know, we're on the clock here. I mean, I, I have to be over my passion for you in about, you know, three days and six hours because I got to go find someone else. His, the way he treated these women is abominable because w once they enter his harem, it is unlikely in most cases they ever saw him again in any romantic or sexual way. He basically took from them their virginity and left them 
nuns for the rest of their life without male companionship unless they cheated on the side. Um, he, now, he made sure that they had everything else they wanted, beautiful clothes, attendants, jewels, um, all of that, but they don't have exactly the thing he promised them, a husband, because he's already on to wife five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty, fifty, 10, 20, 50 or so, or wife 999 by the time we're done. And, and the purpose of the wives generally in that age was as um, bonds for contracts or, or what we would call foreign treaties, non-aggression treaties. Uh, we, want, we want to make sure that we don't have problems with your nation. So I'll marry your daughter and you can marry someone from my court. And that way we're all one big happy family. and We wouldn't conceive of attacking each other because we're all family. On the other hand, if either of us tries it, we have ready-made hostages. Hmm. Not really a flattering way of doing things. But in the history of not the to world, mention it's yeah. also a political treaty with people who are opposed to you. Yes. And opposed to your God. Because if they were if they were servants of your God, this would not be necessary. As long as you're both serving the same God, you can have, you know, some friendly words on paper, but basically you're going to hold each other accountable and you're going to get along most of the time. It's when you, I'm worshiping Jehovah and you're worshiping Baal and you're worshiping Moloch and you're worshiping Zeus and you're worshiping Ra, that there seems to be a certain lack of unity. Now, all the others could say, well, you know, it's all the same God at bottom. And given their metaphysics, their philosophy of religion, they'd be telling the truth. Uh, for them, God had many faces. And a God in one country had his counterpart and a God of another country. Or we have just more of God than you do and are more of God to speed up your less of God. So your less of God is to come to you. They, they can handle that because none of their gods were exclusive. Uh, they were gods for the moment, gods for this particular place. And if our gods went cool. But Jehovah claimed absolute sovereignty over all the nations of the world and said there was none like him. And he was not to be put on the same level as any other God. And Solomon knew this. And God appeared to him twice and warned him about this very thing. The temptation is going to be to worship other gods because that means buying into the religious philosophies of these nations, mm -hmm. swearing by their gods to create uh, mutual defense treaties or non-aggression treaties. Big political thing. I believe it was uh, President Jimmy Carter who went to Japan. And in this spirit of cooperation and recognizing the unity of all gods, laid a wreath at a Shinto shrine. Jimmy Carter, who had coined the political phrase, born again. Turned out he didn't mean what the Bible meant, but it took a while for us to figure that one out. Um, but, you know, you need to placate. We want Japan on our side. We need to placate them in terms of their religion. I don't know if anyone has really noticed that their religion is still emperor worship, but... Um, that's something we're going to I, we have to deal with it, sometimes. It, I think to some people have noticed that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they're rewriting the history books to show how their nation was sold out and how they are still the greatest nation ever. And Yeah. Well, if because your nation is the greatest nation ever, how did it ever get so uh, oblivious to be sold out? That's what I want to know. <laughs> we were betrayed. That's it. We were betrayed. So you're not so, strong enough to withstand betrayal. Awesome. No, uh, we are so kind and gentle-hearted. We would never suspect anyone of treachery, but we won't make that mistake again. Anyway, whatever, however it plays out. This is the kind of thing Solomon was up against, and the solution was simply to trust Jehovah. And trust his promises, his words, his protection, but trust men obey. It means well, you have to walk in God's commandments. And it's also interesting, too. I, I just thought of a connection back to... Uh, the patriarchs and how mm -hmm. not trusting the promises of God led to extra marriages. Yes, isn't that mm -hmm. interesting? How that lines up so often. Yeah, uh, and and the what God had told Israel was, "You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for they surely will turn away your heart after their gods." God laid it out: you marry them, you will worship their gods. Not, hey, why don't you go marry them so they can worship your God? <sighs> that never works. How Evangelistic dating, dating has, work? Yeah, missionary dating has a strong 
limitations. Hashtag date to save. <laughs> I, I know of exactly one person where that worked out. And um, dozens and dozens and dozens worked yeah, out. Yeah, where it didn't. Yeah, I, I can think of one that kind of worked out, I guess. She had had a habit, although she was a young Christian, she was not a disciple of all the things. She didn't know much. And she had a, a, a tendency of dating whoever and getting involved in whoever. But mm -hmm. finally, she got to the point of realizing, no, that's wrong. God does not want me to do that. I will not do that again. And a young man, who's a very nice young man, uh, comes and, and tries to court her. And she says, no, you're not a Christian. Oh, well, I can become one. No, you can't. It doesn't work like that. Uh, well, I'm a, show me how I become a Christian. Talk to me about this Christianity thing. I'll become a Christian. No, it doesn't. But he had, he persisted, and she tried to avoid him, and he ended up going to our pastor and talking to the faith and to, to other people. And eventually, the young lady said to our pastor, look, he claims he's a Christian now. What do you think? I don't know. I'll talk to him. We'll see. Yeah, it sounds like he's a Christian now. What? No! <laughs> <laughs> They ended up getting married, and as far as I know, they're happy together. But I was also thinking of another young lady who uh, had done some, uh, was was going out with an unbeliever, just a single date. It was apparently not a big deal in and of itself. But someone kidded her about missionary dating. She said, missionary dating? Religion was the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the uh, problem with missionary dating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think she thought that over after a while and hope figured out that was not the way to say that. Um, <laughs> but there, we've been talking about this close connection between God and his people to whom he is said to be married. Jesus is our husband. We are his bride. And a king who marries a bride and therefore ought to be faithful to her. In Judges, we saw what happened when the, the Levites, the pastors, the Bible teachers, weren't faithful to their wives, did not protect their wives, did not uh, secure them. And then the priests in 1 Samuel, who start raping the nuns at the temple door, or tabernacle door. The Bible keeps pounding this in. And when we get to um, the New Testament and the letter to Timothy, one of the first things we're told that elders and then deacons are to be a one woman man, because we're imaging Christ. And you can't image Christ and have your emotions and commitments and sexual activities spread over a thousand women. It's not loving to them. It is not kind. The fact that you're paying them well means they're really pricey whores. Um, but even then, they're being used. They've been put into this position by their fathers, who are kings. Um, they don't have much to say about it. They are a tool of state. They are a tool of, of politics. And what they get out of it, yes, comfy and cush, but not true marital fulfillment by any means. And so this is what Solomon went along with. So we can look at it from that point of view. How he treats women is, is just really, really bad. We can also, as Emily suggested before we started, look at how what this means for Israel. He's supposed to be a husband to Israel, prefiguring Christ and, and his relationship to the church. But Israel's the one who suffers. He's He's selling armaments to nations that are one day going to turn on Israel. Mm. He's calling down God's judgment upon the monarchy. Eventually, his sins are going to lead to a divided kingdom before this is all done. Uh, there are political and sociological and even climatic um, issues involved here. Weather gets involved. The law said, I'll close up heaven. I'll turn your earth into, into um, what does he say? The heaven is brass and your earth, I guess, is iron. Uh, it won't produce. Your crops won't produce when God is offended because, as you were talking earlier, it's it's we're in this together. This is a covenant unity, and covenant representatives can make decisions and actions that call down God's wrath upon the whole body. Mm. And Solomon preeminently was put there. He is such a wonderful picture, or could have been such a wonderful picture of Jesus. But he goes off after that. And um, I was thinking of this a while ago in a conversation about um, immigration, actually, mm -hmm. where um, I don't know, I think somebody was quoting David French or somebody who was like, immigration is the loving Christian thing, like open borders or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And one friend and I were both kind of like, 
I don't think the Bible prescribes that. In fact, like the job of the government is to take care of the nation. We don't want to confuse the free offer of the gospel with the free offer of America. Like those are not the same thing. And then the obligation of the government is to the country that is their home, you know? So like, you know, I support lots of immigration, but the, let's keep things in perspective here. They have a covenant relationship with a nation for which you are working. You don't have a covenant obligation to everyone who wants to live there. Mm -hmm. You know, the, in Israel, there were open borders for people who came peaceably, but peaceably meant you had to abide by the laws of the land. And one of those laws was you don't get to worship your God out in public. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that they had a right to worship their God privately. It just meant that the state didn't have the power to go snooping, looking through your window to see what you were doing in, behind closed doors. As with so many things that the Bible condemns, it, it condemns them and God will be judged, but it doesn't necessarily give human government the power to go and look mm. for them. It drives sin underground, which is where it belongs. Mm. Uh, and ultimately, only God will judge some things. But in terms of um, the United States, so there, there was a time um, in the 1800s when America's borders were relatively well open and people came from Southern and Eastern Europe and came flooding in. A lot of people were concerned that this would overwhelm everything. They'd settle in their little ghettos. They'd be stirred up by demagogues. And eventually we would see something equivalent to the French Revolution in, in, in the Eastern cities. And this is in part where the plea for public schools came in. We need to Christianize these people. But what really happened was certainly not the public schools. It was the churches that went into the ghettos and opened Sunday schools, mm. schools where they taught people to read using the Bible. And a lot of these people were cycled into established churches uh, and where their faith was either matured or redirected or given birth. And America did not face that. Now, today, when people come across the border, one, they're often outlaws with criminal records. We have no way of tracing them, following them, or when we do, we ignore the fact. And we don't see churches on the border with evangelism stations. Okay, all you illegal immigrants, come over here. We're going to tell you about Jesus <clears throat> before we send you back. Um, it just, the, the churches by and large have not taken a lead here. Although the Bible welcomed people to Israel, it did not guarantee them automatic citizenship. Some peoples never got to be citizens. That is, they could never, what we would call, vote or hold office. Uh, some could, but it took three generations. They had to assimilate into Israeli culture, mm. meaning ultimately they did have to accept the God of Israel. They didn't have to believe in Jehovah to live there. But if they wanted any role of leadership, this is God's nation, and you had to submit yourself to the Lord himself. So there was a plan there. But of course, if people came with weapons, that's called invasion. <laughs> and that was to be repelled. Uh, and if there were a bunch of cutthroats, then you do what David did. You took a band of men out and you hunted them down and you killed them all. Um, and, so, and I think, too, there's a difference between, like you're saying, the co coming in to have the rights of citizenship mm -hmm. and coming in for, you know, economic pur purposes functionally it's like being being the token libertarian on the podcast um, <laughs> i i really like the idea of there being borders open for free trade instead of yeah. mm -hmm. all the nonsense and and uh legislation that currently surrounds yeah things i don't think like you have any arguments from us on that one no <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think so but obviously uh, national defense is still a thing yeah. that you need to take into account, and uh, you don't automatically give everyone who comes across the right to vote. Um, yeah. Voting is not a human right. <laughs> correct. No, because, it's actually that's the not. Thing too, because that's the thing. It uh, voting, or really just citizenship rights, is a right of citizenship, and so mm -hmm. like you wouldn't expect to immigrate 
for a period of six months to the United Kingdom and then vote on Brexit. Um, <laughs> but for some reason, it, it's uh, it's a given that anyone who, who comes into the United States is given voting rights and uh, a driver's license and, and all these various types of uh, things that functionally should be limited to American citizens. Yeah. That um, is actually how it works in California. If you're listening somewhere that is not California, that is how it works here. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's why I left California partially. <laughs> but it, but in any case, you know, there there are things that are human rights, and there are things that even our constitution recognizes as a human right: life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in in our particular secular orientation. But that doesn't extend to every aspect of what American citizens enjoy. Citizenship is covenant membership. Mm-hmm. And if you are not under the sanctions of the covenant that is answerable to the covenant authorities and able to be called up to execute the sanctions of the covenant, fight in an, in an army or a militia, uh, if you're male, uh, or provide other support if you're female, uh, if you're not, if you can't We're not do biologists, those things, though. Yeah, but <laughs> if you can't do those things, then... You don't get to tell us how we do those things or do much of anything else, actually. You're welcome to be here and live peaceably under our laws. And if that's economically advantageous, good for you. That's wonderful. Yeah. And maybe one day you'll see that you really do want to be part of this great experiment of liberty. And maybe we actually need you because some of our some immigrants have a better clue on what liberty is than people who've grown up here for five generations. Well, there's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm reminded of the scene in 12 Angry Men where the Italian immigrant gets in the face of uh, one of the other jurors and says, it is a privilege to serve on a jury. There's This is a word where democracy and liberty and freedom and responsibility mean something. I've come here for this. How can you just laugh it off as something that's too much... It's, you, you just want to get to a ball game. You're going to throw this away when you are given this great responsibility to decide a man's life. Okay, that's good. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah. even apart, even apart from uh, all of the initial reasons he gave, like you're deciding a man's life. Don't treat yeah. this flippantly. <laughs> exactly. Well, some things about Solomon, uh, kind kind of already winding down here. But I, I think we need to ask ourselves, maybe without a good answer, is why Solomon did this. Well, the obvious reason is purely political. These, all these thousand women, and, and only 700 were princesses, the rest were just other romantic sexual encounters. But at least the princesses were used to worshiping their own God and having their own way. And after being here for, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, they begin to think, I miss home. And I miss my goddess. I miss my god. I miss my pantheon. I want to worship the way I'm used to worshiping because I don't have any other comfort here. And this god of yours is so strange. I mean, he's invisible. I can't even see him or visualize him. So, uh, dear husband, in order to keep me happy and express my happiness when I write home to daddy, my king father, wouldn't you please arrange for me to have chapel services for my god? And little by little, Solomon begins to give in. Of course, you once you give in, all the wives now want it. <laughs> and he has to keep them all happy. So politically, it's easy to see why once you go down this direction, you're, you're kind of screwed. But I think the question we need to consider is how, how did the wisest man in the history of the world, save our Lord himself, justify this, rationalize this? What do you say when your advisors come and say, um, you're introducing... Uh, polytheism and idolatry just outside the temple gate on this mount over here. What's that all about, Solomon? What are you thinking? What 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 does he say at that point? Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> happy religious nation. liberty. Yeah, it's religious liberty. Okay, there we go. That there's that. Surely you don't want me to prescribe how they should worship. Isn't freedom of religion a given in our nation? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, sure, they, 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 we're keeping it quiet and out of sight. What do you want to do, execute them or something? Um, or, um, well, you know, an idol is nothing in the world, but there's no, no God but the <laughs> one. So this is just a matter of me exercising my Christian liberty. They can do whatever they want. They're just this, These idols are pieces of stone and wood. They don't mean anything. If it makes them happy and keeps us from wars, 
isn't that a small price to pay? Just in the world, it's nothing. My heart's it's, not in it, so it doesn't yeah, matter. My, my, my heart, I don't mean it. I don't mean anything by it. So obviously, it's not really a sad. I was very sincere in my worship <laughs> of Tash. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yes, they're they're so sincere. They found the most sincere pumpkin patch in the world, and uh, <laughs> and are worshiping their gods and goddesses in it. How? What could possibly be wrong with this great sincerity? Of doesn't God wear many faces? Is he manifest in all of nature? Um, I mean, we talk about angels and cherubim and all that. Aren't these sort of little gods? I mean, if you put it in that perspective, it's all right. We can have little gods as long as we recognize the transcendent God who lies beyond all. Our our, our theology is big enough to accommodate that. Um, I mean, we wouldn't want to put God into, you know, a, a scroll-shaped box. Yeah, exactly. God is big. God is too great to be contained in any one religion. Yeah, well, we could go on like this, I suspect, for a long time because this is <laughs> probably the, way <laughs> the, the easiest world, game right? in the world to play. <laughs> yeah. Pretty to much. make up reasons why we don't have to be faithful to the one true God and why we don't have to require it of other people. Well, I mean, I believe in Jehovah, but who am I to force my opinions on someone else? King of Israel, in this case, high Supreme Court judge, um, image of Messiah. In the you're married line, to these people. <laughs> and you're married to these people. And do you care about their souls at all? Oh, that's right. Sincerity is enough. We don't need anything more. And so as, as, we, um, as we look at Solomon, we see a wonderful beginning, it seems, and a horrible end. In the end, God passes judgment and says that for his sins, for the idolatry that he did, not what his wives did, but what he did, God's going to rent the kingdom from him. For David's sake, he, Solomon and his heirs will retain one tribe of Judah. Actually, it's more like Judah and Benjamin with a bunch of Levites and a bunch of people from other tribes who decide to go there because it's a little more Christian than the, a little more God than the Northern Kingdom. But the kingdom's divided and the Northern Kingdom never recovers. And the Southern Kingdom is, has a bumpy ride until the Babylonian captivity. And, and it's in many ways, it is Solomon's fault. And one little footnote to all of this, um, in the days of Josiah, during his revival and his reform is trying to get rid of all the idolatry out of Judah, he finally gets around to the Mount of Olives and sees the shrines that Solomon built for his wives. This is what, 600 years later, give or take? And all of the intervening kings, including Hezekiah, had not removed them. In spite of all the great revival that Hezekiah had led for generations earlier, they hadn't gone near them. You have to ask, why not? Well, probably because Solomon built them. And, you know, when some great person leaves something great behind, we don't want to remove the monument, even if it's an idol to a false god. It took Josiah was the only one with the guts to go and say, doesn't matter, tear it all down. It's going out of here. Um, that mountain that we know as the Mount of Olives in his day was called the Mount of Corruption. Because it was so full of this stuff. To what yeah. degree important people used it, we have no way of knowing, but somebody was using it. Uh, we know enough of, now I'm reading a mystery story that involves uh, Horace dancing and folk religion. Uh, there will, uh, among the superstitious and ignorant, there will always be little strains of idolatry. And that's why the light of the gospel has to keep shining. We have to keep preaching and teaching the gospel over and over and over again. It's the most basic elements because people are stupid, people are mm. foolish. And they will grab on to superstitious ideas because they're, it's what my dad believed and his dad before him for five generations. So we're not going to change anything now. And besides, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's not really heathen. I'm quoting from the psalm. Yeah, it's no, it's wrong. And God will be worshipped alone. And we are to have one hus one divine husband, one divine bridegroom. Because he has one church, one bride. And he's absolutely faithful. And he calls us to be faithful in the same manner. As far as looking forward, as uh, all scripture that we're looking at now points forward to Christ, um, it's an interesting parallel to me to see that uh, what is called the Mount of Corruption is the same place that our Lord goes on the night before, or technically the night of, I forget how it would be reckoned in Jewish <laughs> days, uh, when he is crucified. He goes to the Mount of Corruption and 
pleads for strength from his father before going to the actual mount of corruption yeah. <laughs> that is the worst. Yeah, and some have actually speculated that Calvary Gogoth actually was the Mount of Olives. Hmm. Um, if nothing else, Jewish tradition said the Mount of Olives was where Isaac had been sacrificed. And you could look out the temple gate across the Brochedron and see the Mount of Olives and they could hmm. point and say, right there, that's where Abraham offered his son. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of irony and foreshadowing in all of this. The Mount of Olives yeah. was very important role, even early on. Uh, and adds to this this understanding of what Jesus took for us, what he took upon himself for us, the corruption that we earned, and that even our even even his best promises to us, we corrupted. And yet he bought us all back out of all of that. Yeah. Our Lord is good. Amen. Amen. And on that note, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Let's uh let's move into recommendations. Emily. Tell us about this book of yours. Okay. I just finished reading a book that I thought was really great. Um, it's called The Great Sex Rescue. Um, and it's taking a look at the most popular and most recommended books and resources on sex and marriage um, in the evangelical world for the past few decades. Um, okay. And looking at the impact that those books have had, which has not been universally good. <laughs> um, Do you so, remember the names of any of these books? Yeah. Well, one big one that features prominently is Love and Respect. <laughs> I don't remember the subtitle or the author. <laughs> I had not heard of it before. Oh, um, I haven't either. There was that one. There's... Um, Wasn't one of them it, sheet Every music? Man's Battle. Sheet oh, yeah. music, yeah. yeah. Um, there were a lot of ones that I'd heard of, a lot that I hadn't heard of, um, a lot that I am now thankful that I had not heard of. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're, what they're trying to do is um, is contribute some evidence to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so they started with a survey of like 22,000 women um, mm -hmm. to see what teachings they had been exposed to, what teachings they espoused, what teachings had been recommended to them and what their lives looked like after that and because of that. And they're not chiefly trying to create a scriptural argument. They're trying to see what works and they deal with scripture along the way, um, which leads to like my one thing where it's like there's a hole in this book is that they kind of dismiss a hierarchical view of marriage, to use their word, um, mm -hmm. which they immediately conflate with power dynamics in an unhealthy mm -hmm. way. Um, Naturally. So so that's the one whole, they, they do deal with the scripture of do not deprive one another, um, which I had no idea was twisted in so many ways by so many books. Um, I don't know that either, and I'm not sure I want to, but okay. Your yeah. mental health will be better off for not. <laughs> well, I, I do recommend reading this book because like it's kind of like being safe and not realizing how dangerous things can be. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I found it a really helpful book. Um, really glad to have read it. I'm recommending it left and right for my married friends. Um, mm. I think our generation particularly needed this book, because um, we've seen both the impact of the courtship fad, mm -hmm. which is not, you know, there were a lot of good things about it, but there were a lot of unintended harmful consequences. Well, there was a lot of legalism that went with it. Yeah, that too. And some misunderstanding of the father's authority and the the um, person, for lack of a better word, of, of the young woman. She's mm -hmm. not a robot. She's not your slave. And she's she not an item. To say. Yeah. 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 And sometimes and then, it did go that way. Yeah. Not and all. then as well as the that whole movement, we also have the explosion of pornography in unprecedented ways. Mm -hmm. Like on the one hand, there's always okay. been porn, right? But on the other hand, we now have the internet and tabbed browsing on the internet and smartphones. And I think our generation is having to reckon with these things in ways that previous generations didn't. 
Oh, definitely. absolutely. As, yeah. as an elder, I can tell you that this is one of our greatest challenges within our church. And whether it be just beginning in young people or whether it be a settled habit in, in older men who have a reputation for maturity and godliness, it's, it has been an extremely destructive thing. And we've even gotten uh, now and then a woman confessing, yeah, I have a problem with that too, which mm -hmm. didn't used to be a thing. Um, but it's everything's changing, and yes, the ready accessibility. Yeah, click your phone and be ready to click it off again if someone walks in the room. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, it's something that other generations have not had to deal with. Yeah, it's not that phones are sinful; it's just that it makes sin so much easier. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we found out that we don't have the spiritual capital, the spiritual reserves to know how to deal with it, and we mm -hmm. we push it off by saying, "Well, the thing's not evil." Yes, but you are. <laughs> Until you recognize that and confess that and are willing to deal with it after gospel fashion, you're probably going to shipwreck your marriage and your family. And I have seen it happen. It's, it is a frightening thing. So yeah. if this book helps in that, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th this is not my recommendation, obviously. But one of our dear friends uh, gave me and my wife a book i think a few days before our wedding and we looked it over uh the day after our wedding and it was you know kind of like these other ones that uh the great sex rescue looks at um and one of the pieces of advice and a emily was just like flipping through it and and trying to see like okay what's the advice in here i really trust the person that gave this to me she said she didn't like look through it a whole lot with her husband but like she liked what she had seen and we found in one of the pages it was like um trying to figure out how to put this delicately <laughs> it basically said if you want to um get an idea for how the wedding night might go then try doing things on your own a bit first Ah. Oh my. Ah. And we were both like, that's no, no, no. that's wrong. <laughs> I believe that book was targeted towards Christians, but I can't remember for certain. Um, it's not obviously right on that point, and potentially many, many more points that we'd never even bothered to look at because and we said, that's so enough. Many, yeah, there are so many books out there that get recommended that don't get checked thoroughly, that are just kind of. Here, I heard this was good. Well, I, also, I also think like, part of it comes from like uh, part of it comes from we don't talk about it very much in yeah. churches. Like, there's very little one-on-one -on -one discipleship happening. So it feels like when someone writes a book, they don't. People are just like, "Oh, thank goodness, somebody wrote something about this. I can yeah. hand it off to the single person very who's about to get so married." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and th that way. I mean, there, there's two problems with that. Is that one, the person giving the book over gets to say, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to have the conversation with them right. directly because that's right. so awkward. And oh. two, it's it's uh, partially, I think, laziness as well. It's like, I don't want to do the work to have that conversation with them. So I guess I could make that part of one of my recommendations <laughs> is like, if you're discipling someone, if you're an older person in the church, or if you have people who are, your peers that are under your wing or something like that like don't be afraid of the awkward conversations whether it's this kind of topic or whether it's any other thing that might make you squirm and feel uncomfortable just just talk to them about it like you're a normal human being <laughs> <laughs> i guarantee because you like 90 percent of the conversations that you fear because you think they're going to be very awkward are way less awkward than you actually think they are <laughs> yes absolutely Usually, yeah. My wife just made the excellent point that uh, when it comes to mentoring and, and menteeing, as it were, um, the mentor carries this this kind of apprehension as well about, um, I could mess up this person's life by giving them advice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot easier to say, oh, let me just hand you off to the expert, because mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm an expert. And... That's also something I, I see a lot in just broader evangelical culture, broader Christian culture, where it's like, oh, I don't know how to have this argument, this conversation in a 
natural human one-on-one -on -one way. So I'm going to link you to an article from my yeah. pastor or to this celebrity pastor, or just listen to this sermon that my pastor preached on Sunday. And the man of God, the expert will be the one that will convince you because I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a profound comment for that. So yes. We, um, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, just in passing, that we in Reformed Presbyterian circles pride ourselves on how well we know doctrine, but when it comes to time to explain it, we often fall flat on our faces. We either are arrogant and 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 deaf to the subtleties of the argument, what the other person is often saying, or we suddenly realize we don't know what in the world to say. Well, <laughs> I know this is right. I've been taught this all my life. I've mean, I heard these great sermons on it. Well, can you explain them to me? Uh, uh, not as such. <laughs> um, and I think I think it does start with just ordinary things. I mean, sexuality is pretty ordinary. It, it is a little scary. I'll give you that. I mean, it is it is private to some extent. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and rightly so. And there are yeah. some things that don't belong necessarily in a public forum. And as a high school teacher, I have to be very careful about what I say. And yet, I think that my students have probably heard more about sexuality from me. Than they have generally in their churches, and frighteningly sometimes from their parents. I remember years ago, uh, a young man asked me, um, "So, what exactly is lust anyway?" When he asked this in class, <laughs> and he was a bright young man from a good family, godly family. So I figured, well, if he doesn't know, probably there are a lot of other people who don't know. So I told him quickly, but rather bluntly, and his response was, "Whoa, I got a lot of repenting to do." <laughs> um, but the shame was his father was an elder in a reformed church. Like, and this young man was at least 14 or 15. Oh, wow. Uh, um, and I can think of a, a, another dad, um, not, not in, in our tradition, and not even necessarily a professing Christian, although his wife most certainly was. But I liked him. He was a good guy. He was a, you know, a guy who worked with his hands. Um, but uh, and he somehow came to respect me because his kids had been in my, my class. He said, my, my son's getting to that age and I need to have that conversation with him. I said, maybe you can give me some ideas about how to explain uh, it, it to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I gave him uh, some euphemistic things he could say because he was obviously afraid to use the names of any, proper names of any body parts. Said, oh yeah, okay, I like that. Okay, I can do that. Because, you know, but talking about, mm, 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 and then he went away. And I'm thinking, your son is 16. He already knows all of this. Mm. I appreciate that now at a late point, you're trying to do the right thing. And I believe my friend was honorable. He, he really thought that this was something his son would not know about. How he, can, how he could not remember where his own youth, I don't know. Uh, but it was, it was sort of, oh, no, my, my, my boy wouldn't. Wouldn't even think about these things. He wouldn't know about sexual being sexually stimulated. I'm still using it for message. Yeah, pretty sure he does. But again, one more example of, of parents afraid to talk and, and nervous because they don't know what to say. And and sometimes there's a legitimate, I screwed up my relationships early on. I screwed, screwed up my sexuality. I have nothing to say. Mm. Well, God does. And sometimes we just need to. Read what God says and said, You understand that? I mean, what, what words? What words here? Okay, let's talk about what adultery means. Okay, fornication. Let me explain to you what that means. Lust. Okay, I can tell you what that one means. Now, why does God not want these things? Well, let's look at Ephesians 5 and see why He doesn't want, want these things. I mean, there are things yeah. you can say. Um, and I think I just discovered my recommendation. And that's, oddly enough, Deuteronomy 6, talking about the Bible with your kids. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a genius, and you don't have to know everything. And you can say, I don't know, uh, but I'll go, I'll go find out. We can continue this conversation another time. And, you know, that's a good question. And it's kind of awkward for me, but I'll try to give you an answer. Uh, this is what we should do. We don't always. We'll screw it up sooner or later. But that I think that needs to be our mindset. 
It's, it's, what, it's what the Bible commands us to do. And, and sometimes we're ready to teach the doctrine of the Trinity and the distinction between the ontological <laughs> economic Trinity and the double possession of the Spirit, and we're not able to say, and this is why you shouldn't be looking at pictures of naked people here. Um, yep. It's... Um, and it's okay to say to your kids, I screwed up, here's how, don't do this. Yeah, like, They will respect you for okay. that. Because <laughs> yes. I, I think, too, along with that is that, you know, a lot of parents try to give off the aura of uh, unfailing, unquestioning, unquestionable moral uh, superiority, oh, and no. that if that facade is broken, then so is a lot of the things that you tried to teach them when you were assuming that error. Yeah, it it's so much better for you and for your children's sake to just be honest about your own shortcomings. If you get mad at them and you become sinfully angry, then you apologize to them and say, yeah. that was not right of me. Uh, and the reason that it's... The, the, the reason I can tell you that is because of this thing called humility that God has graciously given to me and that he calls us all to have. And uh, I know that Christ has died for that sin. I've repented for it, and it's it's covered by His blood. And then you can you you can take any mistake and point it, <laughs> put them right back to Jesus, because point now Jesus, yes, it's it's something that you also have to appeal to for right standing with God. It's not just it's not the child is the one who makes mistakes against the um, sheer. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? The sheer cliffs of insanity, uh, you know, <laughs> just unyielding wall of perfection that their yeah. parents supposedly are. It's not how it works. Yeah. If there is one thing that parents must be, it's vulnerable and honest and transparent. I don't think that means you have to tell them every single sin you've ever committed for one to <laughs> take too long. No. Um, but in general, well, you, it's, it's been four hours. I've made it to March 1st of my seventh year. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's... Yeah. And, and, and we must be humble. I, when you were... This is kind of a reach, but when you were saying what you were saying, I went back to an old book called Robinson Crusoe, where Crusoe was explaining to Friday how forgiveness works. And for those of you who do not know, Robinson Crusoe is a Christian book about Robinson Crusoe's personal conversion. Unfortunately, that section, which is the major theme of the book, has been edited out of a lot of modern versions. It's irrelevant. Nah. But he's trying to explain to this, this man who he is leading out of heathendom and idolatry. Uh, and he, he uses words like the nature of the new covenant in Jesus' blood and the glorious <laughs> kingdom of God and the realities of the new birth and and, uh, and how we can all be forgiven. And Friday's response is something like, oh, good. You repent, I repent, Satan repent. We all be forgiven. <laughs> okay, <there's... laughs> wait. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we know that's not going to happen, but I, I, you know, the, the principle is right. He's a little confused, but he got the spirit of it. <laughs> you understood some of it. You know. Anyway, so that's, that's my recommendation. Talk to your kids about the Bible. It starts by sometimes just opening the Bible or sometimes it's saying by saying, hey, what happened today that's worth talking about? So I'm going to make my my proper recommendation, so to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Much, I thought you... It's perfectly fine. The flow of conversation dictated elsewise. <laughs> um, my recommendation is a web app called Notion. It's at, it's like the word Notion, uh, mm -hmm. N-O-T-I-O-N dot S-O. It is a – the thing is it's so hard to describe because it kind of <laughs> does everything. It's – Google Drive, it's uh, a task manager, it's a calendar system if you want it to be. Uh, it's And all these things are, are modular and it's built with blocks. Um, so you can have a page uh, that has uh, an inline database. Mm -hmm. And uh, what confused me at first was that it was not like an Excel spreadsheet. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a true database. If you have a column, the column is the column all the way down. You can't edit the formula partway down mm. for one cell. So that that was one thing that was confusing and a little bit difficult to work around at sometimes, especially because 
were also using it at work, and my goal was to take Excel spreadsheet put into Notion. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> um, but it's 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 very very cool. Uh, one of the things that makes it most powerful is um, the databases and the ability to do interrelations between databases and even between properties within the same database. So that uh, one practical function of that is you can you can make uh, tasks with their own relevant subtasks, and you can have a database that contains, let's say, your teams, and then you create a relation between that database and another database for tasks. And you know, you basically say this task is associated with this entry in the um, in the teams database. All this kind of stuff. So it's 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 very powerful in what you can eventually do with it. And I am nowhere near an expert yet, but I am. I'd, I'd say I'm on the upper end of moderately um, proficient. So, so far it's been great. I've actually put a whole bunch of things into it, and my wife has completely overhauled her productivity thing in Notion. She has our meal plans for this week, next week, the week after that, all planned out in Notion. Uh, the to do list for each day for each of us, her long term plans, her short term term plans or middle term plans, etc. So you can really use it for a multitude of things. And the best way to kind of figure out what you can use it for is to just fiddle around with it as much as you can um, <laughs> and come to understand what the actual functions are. So that's my recommendation. It's a really great productivity tool that I love. I even put my notes for a role-playing campaign that I am developing into Notion and my mm-hmm. database for the campaign has things like factions and villains and NPCs and player characters and locations, if I hadn't already said that one, items, magical items, etc. And it's very, very cool. Nice. Okay, very good. All right. Well, thank you both so much for uh, joining me for this conversation. I, I really enjoyed this episode. We had good talks. To our listener who is now listening to this episode, if you would like to follow us if you are not already, you may do so on YouTube, Rumble, you can follow our Facebook page, which is very inactive at the moment, but you can still follow it and we will eventually (laughs) post things again. Uh, And if you want to subscribe to us, you can do so through any of the podcast catchers that exist. And then uh, if you want to email us, uh, if you have questions, please send us your questions. We would be happy to answer them uh, at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. If you would like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash haltingtowardzion. Thank you so much to our listeners who do support us financially. You make the show happen. And thank you to David Mack who does all the editing and gets these episodes out to you. We will see you next time.